So our next speaker uh, is uh, Ian Peters, who is actually a real physicist, it tells me here, and he's going to talk to about us uh, on carbon metrics in PV. So again, real physicist, PV research for 20 years, Fraunhofer Institute, University of Singapore, and now at the Helmholtz Institute in Nuremberg. So over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I've been asked for by Sue to come here and to tell something about carbon metrics. She called me a few months back and uh, um, asked whether I could do this. And this is a question I had thought about a little, but not in a, in a very contained uh, um, environment. So I said, I think I can do this. And I'm going to present to you today kind of my thought process that developed over the past week and months. So, um, before I do this, I want to do a very quick introduction where I'm coming from. So, contrary to what this map might want to make you believe, Erlangen is not actually located in Bayern in Bavaria. It's in the northern part of it, which is called Franconia. And it's a thing in that state that the northern part tries to maintain its very own and unique culture. I, I'm not sure that's something you can relate to here. Anyway, uh, Erlangen is a very beautiful place. Um, this is a picture of the uh, a fountain that's just outside the university at the park and the, the botanical garden there. So I can really just recommend everyone you should visit and have a look at it. It's stunning. And uh, what the Franconians are very proud of is their food. And really, if you think about food in Franconia, you get what you probably think about food in Germany, which is Würste and Sauerkraut. I, I, I have to admit they're really delicious. I'm not from the area I came there, I loved it. And we also have a, a celebrity. Um, everybody in this room probably knows who this person are, even if, though if you don't rem uh, recognize it from the picture. This is Georg Simon Ohm, the inventor of the electrical resistance, of course. Okay, so coming to the, the question at hand, uh, um, what can we tell about carbon emissions of uh, PV? And I, I thought very long and hard about this, and uh, I'm very glad that I can present you with my conclusions on this, which is that a PV system actually doesn't emit any carbon dioxide. So thank you for that. I'm glad that <laughs> <laughs> um, I, okay, I, I'm, I get from the reaction that it's, I, I seem to be a little bit on low time. I'm, I have a few minutes left, so I, I did prepare some backup slides, so maybe I just go over those. Um, these, does anybody know in the room who, who these two people are? Sue, so you know. It's not Monty Python. It's uh, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. These two are called Lanquil and Fook, and they play a small but very significant role in that book. And I, I won't go into the details for anyone who hasn't read this because I don't want to spoil this. But the part that they're involved in they kind of find out that the reason for planet Earth is to think about one important question. And I really, really like that idea, that what we are supposed to do here is to think about the right and the important questions. So I want to ask a few questions related to uh, um, carbon emissions or carbon accounting for PV. And the first one, this is one that we get kind of all the time, is does a PV module generate more energy than it is used in its production? This comes up quite often in PV. So there are two metrics that are related to this. The first one is called energy return of investment, and the second is energy payback time. They both put into perspective kind of what is the energy that's coming out of a PV system and, and what is the energy that goes into this. You know, the first one, uh, um, ERI, is simply the ratio of those. Right? You calculate the entire energy that your system produces over its lifetime, and you set that into perspective to all the energy that's used for its production and its operation. And the second one is basically, uh, so the ERI, you want this, of course, to be as big as possible. Mm -hmm. The energy payback time is basically the time it needs to reach an ERI of one. So how long do you need to, you know, your system to run in order to recover all the energy need, needed to generate it? And obviously, you want this to be as short as possible. So let's try to find out how, how you can actually get a hold of those numbers. And it's actually surprisingly difficult to get a very good answer what they are. The more easy bit is to calculate the energy that's coming out of your system. There are very well established metrics and, and, and 
possibilities to do this. I'm showing you a very simple way to do this. Of course, you can go into many more details, but this is a, a, a relatively good way of uh, um, estimating this. The first thing that you need to know is the capacity of your system. So I'm using a single panel, 340 watt is a typical panel that you can buy today. Um, then it depends on where you do this. I did this yesterday night, so I hope I didn't make any mistakes in the calculations for Edinburgh. You get from the Global Solar Atlas a typical capacity for 900 roughly kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak installed. Then it depends on how long you let your system run. Uh, PV panels today we can, can get warranties for about 30 years. Um, and Sue yesterday told me that she has one that's 20 years old, 28 years old, 28 on her house and still going strong. So 30 is, they can last for 30 years, definitely. And how quickly they get worse. So a typical degradation rate, this was a study from NREL, um, really for worldwide PV system, and they found typical numbers for silicon are around 0.9%. If you do this and you run the calculations, you end up with a lifetime energy production of the system for about 8,000, a little bit more than 8,000 kilowatt hours. Okay, so come to the second part that's a bit more difficult, the energy that goes into making a solar panel. And surprisingly, this is really data that's not exactly easy to find. And I'm going to tell you in a little bit why that is. But first, there are two studies that I could find that, that did quite detailed studies on this. The first one is from Erika Lekissi. She is from um, the Lifecycle Institute at Albiano. And she did a very detailed study about the energy that goes into making a panel. Another one came from Fraunhofer Ise and is partially published, partially still working on that. But what they found is roughly 500 kilowatt hours per module in the year 2021. And the reason I say the year 2021 is that actually there has been a lot of innovation, a lot of progress made in the PV industry. And the amount of, well, this is basically you can take this as a measure for the energy needed to make the system. Just in five years, the amount of energy required to make a solar panel has gone down by about 50%. A lot to do with how we are producing silicon, for example. But anyway, this is, this is an important part that I'm going to come back to, that there's a lot of innovation and a lot of dynamics in the, in, the, in the solar industry. Okay, but making the panel is actually not the whole story. And if you have worked, or people are working in carbon accounting, you know all the problematics that I'm going to talk to you about. It's where do you really put the boundary of what you account for, right? It's like you have the manufacturing, that's the most immediate thing you can think about, but then you also have operation of maintenance of the system, you should account for that. You have the transport, you need to get the panels to where they need to be installed, and then you actually had to build the factory. You had to build the supply chain, you had to build the roads that go to the supply chain, you have to employ people. They require energy, their families require energy, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you can almost draw a kind of arbitrary line about this, and there's no real truth about this. You can find good arguments for doing one or the other. If you go to the widest circle possible, what you would find is that we are living on this planet on an ERI of one. We are consuming all the energy that we're producing. But that's not sensible if you want to, com if you want to compare different kinds of technologies. So there is a recommendation from the IEA what you should do if you want to do this consistently, and that's really all this is about. Yeah? You should draw a circle around see the first three of those and do this for all the kind of energy technologies. And again, this is not necessarily to say that what comes out of this is the one truth, is you do this if you want to do a comparison with other technologies. So if you do this, you find that the operation and maintenance part as well as the transportation parts are relatively small compared to the pro production of the panel. So you still end up with something around 500 kilowatt hours per month. You'll put a bit of an arrow bar on this to you know, your own liking as much you, you want to have this. But this is roughly the comparing value that you get. And if you compare this to the 8,300 that the system gets out, even in Edinburgh, you would get an ERI of around 16. So definitely a lot more energy produced than you need for the production. Um, if you're following this metric, you can calculate the energy payback time, which would be about 1.5 years. So you need to run your system for 1.5 years to recover the energy needed for its production. And in fact, these are relatively high values because you know, Edinburgh is not exactly the sunniest location on the planet. Depending on where you go, you can go down to almost to less than half a year for a silicon panel. And if you take other technologies like cadmium telluride, 
it goes down by another factor of two. And if you go to some of the new technologies that are currently developed, like organic photovoltaics or, or perovskite photovoltaics, you can have energy payback times that are calculated in weeks or months. Yeah. So you can definitely generate a lot more energy with a solar panel than, um, than you need for its production. The question is then, I, sorry, this is a comparison to the other technologies based on this analysis. How, do, how are we doing with solar compared to all the other energy technologies? Well, it's pretty much in the same range, right? I mean, the, there's not that much of a difference if you look at ERI across technology, the one big exception being hydroelectricity. Uh, that can recover more, a lot more energy than you, than you put into it. Um, the thing with solar is that we did an estimate for with you know, technology that we can foresee and we really, if we, if we were to enable some of these new plastic photovoltaics, we believe that you could get this, this value up to about 100. The uh, important part would also be to make existing technology last longer. Um, we actually see no reason that a solar panel outdoors can't last 50 years. So why is there still a discussion about energy payback time? Well, one of the reasons that I could trace back was a study that was done by Ferroni and Hopkirk in 2016 for Switzerland for one particular system where they calculated an ERI of 0 0.8, and that would then constitute a net loss. Um, that study was countered by another study of Raugi et al. who looked at this and to pointed out a, a few things that they thought were not well done. They, they said there were some old numbers were used. They said that some double accounting was done. So they recalculated it and came up with a factor of between seven or eight. The, the main point, and I, I'm not, you know, want to very much argue here for or against one or the other. I think that uh, Raugi did a more thorough job, but maybe you read it yourself and decide for yourself. But, but the important point really that came onto this is the absolutely stunning development that, that happened in photovoltaic. And this is a graph, I apologize that there's still some German left. I put this in yesterday night and didn't have the time to translate all of it. Um, this here is the cost reduction that you have of photovoltaics over in the 10 year period between 2009 and 2019 um, from being kind of the most costly way to generate electricity to the cheapest way available to produce electricity. And um, 2022 in many ways has been an exciting year for the PV community. This is a, a, something that science uh, put out in one of the magazines saying that solar is the cheapest energy in history. Uh, I think it's probably more accurate to say electricity than energy. If you've got ways to access energy that are probably more cost effective, but at least the cheapest way to produce electricity in history is solar by now. And when I started PV, that was unthinkable, right? And this has this dynamic, uh, the cost is just one effect of it, right? I've shown you the, the energy efficiency. There are many aspects that go into to, to this that make solar so interesting and, and so fast developing. Um, one interesting uh, consequence of that is that if you are using numbers in any accounting for solar and you make assumptions that are based on numbers that are like five, six years old, for almost any energy technology that would be okay if you do this for solar, you're completely wrong. Yeah? So your assumptions, your calculations, anything that you project for solar have to account for this very dynamic development of the technology. And we're not done. There are, the next innovations are already implemented in the new factors that are going to come. It might not you know, go at the exact same speed that we did before. Maybe it does. Right? It has done for 40 years, actually, and everybody has always said it won't continue, and it has. But even if it slows down, it's still going be, to be incredibly dynamic. Okay, the next question that we could ask, and we're coming closer again to the carbon accounting is, do PV modules actually contribute to reducing carbon emissions on the planet? How do we can account for that? And um, the first thing that we should look into is the embodied carbon. How much carbon is actually associated with making and running a solar panel? And there are two major contributions to this. The first one is that, well, you have to make silicon out of silicon dioxide out of sand. And this is a chemical part, and I'm mentioning this because it's essential. You cannot get rid of this. Now, the chemical reaction is shown down here. What you do basically is to reduce silicon dioxide to silicon and carbon monoxide. And I haven't found literature on this, but to the best of my knowledge, this is scrubbed and turned into carbon dioxide. And the second thing is that to make a solar panel, you need an awful lot of energy, or not an awful lot, but you need energy, and this energy is associated with a carbon footprint because we're still producing carbon for making electricity. Right? So let's have a look at these two contributions. The first one, 
Um, like I said, I've never found this before, so I did the calculations myself. I come up with a number of about 2.7 kilograms of carbon dioxide for a module for the amount of silicon that you need. And it's actually very little. Uh, it's something that you cannot avoid. You always have to do this, but it is a very, very small contribution. So let's look at the second part. Um, how do we account for embodied carbon? And there has been a study also recently done at Fraunhofer Easel that has been looking at this. I've shown you before roughly what the energy need is to make a solar panel. And then it depends on where you make it, right? What is the, the carbon footprint of the energy mix that you use to make this panel? I've done a comparison here between China and Germany. These are the, uh, the energy intensities of the, uh, um, the, the infrastructure that they have together with the decarbonization targets. Uh, Germany is actually inaccurate. It has shifted forth also to 2035. This graph was done before they shifted this forward and China has uh, announced to be carbon neutral by 2060. So if you take a, a solar panel that was made in the year 2020 and you account for this, uh, say a solar panel made in China, you end up with, this is the most accurate number that has currently probably been done around 800 kilograms of carbon per solar panel. So if you project this out for a 30 year system lifetime with rated carbon emissions, again here for Edinburgh, you end up with 38 grams per kilowatt hour as the embedded carbon production that is you know, associated with all the carbon emissions with the solar panel. And uh, again, we can compare this to other sources. Uh, um, solar in that point would be very similar to other um, renewables. Um, of course, all the fossil fuels would be a lot higher than that. But there's one thing, one absolute essential thing missing in the discussion so far. And we've seen this in the energy balance, and it comes really back to this first statement that I've made. If you run a solar system, during the operation of this, you do actually not emit any carbon, yet you are producing energy. And the whole point of us installing solar panels is to produce carbon-free electricity. So we have to find a way to put that into the equation. And I haven't found many metrics to do this, but I have worked on one myself. And that is an, no, again, that it's not the or truth that you can make, but it's kind of one way to go on about this. And the idea that I had was the following. So we take into account all the carbon that is embodied in the, in the solar panel. And then when you install it, you assume that it displaces an amount of carbon similar to the, um, to the amount that would otherwise have, produced in the, have been produced in the grid, right? And then you can you basically end up with something that starts to grow linearly. Why does this here veer off? Well, this was done for Germany with the assumption that Germany is going to become carbon neutral at one point. And if you do not have any carbon in the grid anymore, you can't displace any further carbon. So the idea here is to take into account also the displacement for this. Yeah. Um, and if you do this, you can come up with a metric here that quantifies the, uh, um, the carbon that you can save with a solar panel. There are other ways to, that have been done in order to do this. Uh, um, a lot has been done, for example, also on calculation for pathways towards 100% renewable or at least to carbon neutrality. And I'm coming to a graph that was already featured in the previous presentation quite prominently, um, which is that this kind of potential of solar energy to replace carbon has recently also been recognized by the IPCC. Yeah. Um, one thing that I have to add, yeah, the, the graph was already quite well discussed in the, in the previous session, but one thing that I have to say, why 22 was a, a good year for PV is that the IPCC has recognized the potential of renewables and just how much they can do and how much they can do at low cost at this scale for the first time in this in the sixth report. Yeah. And it has shown that PV is the most efficient thing and also the most cost effective thing that you can do in order to get rid of carbon. So one last slide of results that I wanted to show and um, I've seen that Mark Jacobson is here on the program so we have one of the pioneers of 100% uh, renewable scenarios in the in the audience. Um, I'm showing results from one other group that has been working on this. This is from Christian Breyer in Finland, who has been doing uh, very detailed scenarios of transitions towards 100% renewables for many different countries or regions around the world. This year is done for the British Isles. I don't know whether you can see this very well. I can't see it very well from, from this angle. But this is an, an idea for how you could generate a 100% um, a renewable energy system in the British Isles and the contribution of solar that, it, that 
or the contribution that solar would make to it. You know, solar is all everything that is yellow here. And the amount of solar that you would have to install is in the range of yeah, two to 400 gigawatts of solar panels. You can think about what the current goals uh, are that you have on those countries and um, you will see that they are probably not ambitious enough to reach something like this. And yeah, I want to really leave you with this. Um, summary is that you know solar is great. <laughs> uh, we can account for the carbon that we do. There is really no one way to do that. Um, you have to be very careful how you account for this and for what purpose you make the accounting. Yeah? You have to be consistent if you want to make comparison with other energies. That's really kind of the most important thing to, to consider and the important point that the IPCC now has uh, um, acknowledged renewable energies to be um, the most efficient way to get rid of carbon. Okay, with that, thank you for your attention. So thank you very much and uh, pretty much on time. Space for one question, anybody who's got one? Yep, this lady here, they probably know each other. <laughs> she already warned me she would have a question. So a question or statement? Yeah, just a, just a quick one. Um, I, and you might not know this, but the last slide, there, there's a lot of hydro in the scenario. How is that going to happen? I mean, are you going to dam all rivers in the world? or in, That's it's very strange to me. Yeah. I, I really do not know the answer to this. Okay, yeah. I took this from Christians, but I think if uh, Bark is here, he might be able to give actually a better perspective on, on that than I can. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so you mentioned 2.7 kilograms CO2 per module, I guess, or per kilowatt hour of uh, embodied carbon. Does it include the embodied carbon associated with the balance of system, like controller, battery, charger, all of the other equipments that are needed for the PV system to work? Mm -hmm. So the 2.7 kilograms that I have shown you, right, that is the amount of carbon released for turning silicon dioxide into silicon. Right, that is just for the PV module. The energy that I've shown you is for PV module as well. If you include the system, it goes up by a little, but it's not that much. I think it's about 30, 40% that you have to include depending on balance of system. And again, it varies a lot on depending on how exactly you build your system. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll have a panel later on. Thank you for now. <laughs>